Hello and welcome to the Farbank Fly Fishing School. I'm your host, Simon Gosworth, and in this episode, I'm going to delve into the mysteries of lake fly fishing. I'm going to talk about the gear you need to fish, I'm going to talk about how to find fish in a lake, and above all, I'm going to talk about the various fly fishing techniques and tactics you need to successfully fly fish in a lake. Before we go down to the water or go fly fishing in a lake, let's just talk about a couple of things I think is really important. Your safety and the licensing. Got to be licensed. So with safety, I would always suggest that you fly fish with a hat on. That means if you hook your head, well, way easier and less pain to take the hook out of your hat than your head. That can happen frequently, so I would suggest you wear a hat. Probably more important, I would suggest you have some kind of eyewear. Um, sunglasses help in bright days. These are Polaroid glasses. I like Polaroid glasses. They actually cut the glare out and help you see fish swimming around. So Polaroid sunglasses are a better option than just regular glasses. But either way, I would suggest you have some kind of cover over your eyes. And then if you're a beginner or if you're perhaps teaching a novice fly fisher, what I would strongly advise is that you fish a fly that either has no barb on it, which you can buy, or if you have barbs, you can crimp them down with a pair of forceps and just flatten that barb. And that way, should your buddy who you're teaching or should you being a novice hook somebody, it comes out of the skin a lot easier with a lot less pain and ripping, it comes out of your clothing easier. And perhaps above all, if you're into catch and release and you put fish back in the water, it comes out of the fish's mouth way easier without ripping its mouth apart. So barbless hooks are probably a good choice, certainly a safe choice for a novice fly fisher. And before you go fly fishing, make sure you've got yourself a fly fishing license that's applicable to the state and the time you're fishing. That's really important. You've got to have a license to fish. Make sure you've read the regulations for where you're going to fish. Some places allow two flies. Some people places allow five flies. So whatever the regulations are, make sure you understand the regulations of the fishery before you go fly fishing and make sure you've got your license and just make sure you're going to be safe when you're out there. Now let's talk about fly fishing in a lake. Perhaps the biggest difference between fly fishing in a river and fly fishing in a lake is that a river has current and the fish lie on the station, but on a lake there's virtually no current, so the fish constantly cruise around. They cruise around because they need oxygen, they need water pushing through their mouth and their gills, so they have to keep swimming for that, and they cruise around looking for food. So in lakes, fish are moving around. It makes it a little bit easier to kind of find a fish and find a spot where the fish go past you, but a lot harder to, to read the lake. Now there might be some kind of current, right? There might be a wind blowing and the wind has ripples and it blows food up towards one end of the lake. So that is one kind of current which we'll investigate and talk about shortly. And another type of current is an inlet or some streams that are coming in, pouring in current, bringing in cooler water or nutrients or food. So there are forms of current in the lake, but generally speaking, lakes don't have current. And what that means to you as a fly fisher is fish are moving around and you've got to work out how to intercept those moving fish. Once you've learned how to read a lake, how to fish, where to fish a lake, and you cast your fly out, and all things happen right, and you catch a fish, well, what are you going to catch out there? What are the fish you're likely to catch in a lake? And how do you identify them? How do you tell your buddy you caught a rainbow trout, not a brown trout? So let's tell you just briefly and show you some of the different trout you're likely to catch in a lake so you can identify them. The most common trout you'll catch in a lake is called a rainbow trout. A rainbow trout is identifiable. It's a fairly big fish, generally speaking. They're the largest of the trout species. They have a silvery flank to them with a darker top section and a, a magenta reddish, purplish hue on the sides of the flanks. Those hues are the giveaway that they're a rainbow trout, this kind of reddish color. So that's a very important thing to look out for. Also on the sides, the, the fish are going to have little black spots. And they're not really a spot as in a round thing. They're more of a freckle more of a kind of irregular shaped thing. And rainbow trout have freckles on the, on the body, on the fins, particularly have them on the tail. That's a really good telltale sign to look for them on the tail. So you're looking for a silvery color fish with purple hues to the side and these freckles on the body and on the tail. And a similar fish to the rainbow trout, same family, it's called a cutthroat trout. It's gonna kind of look like a rainbow trout, but it's gonna be generally a little bit smaller. The cutthroats tend not to get so big as rainbows. But the two big factors that identify a cutthroat over a rainbow is that first of all, the sides of the cutthroats are a little bit more yellow than silver, generally speaking. 
But the biggest giveaway is when you flip the fish upside down and look under its chin. And under its chin, there are two orange marks that give it away as a cutthroat, hence the name, cutthroat. So if you're not sure whether you've got a rainbow or a cutthroat trout, turn it upside down and look under its chin and see if you've got these orange marks there, and that will be the giveaway and telltale. Another trout a lot of people target and love is what's called a brown trout. A brown trout is usually a golden color, much more golden than silver. And a brown trout has round spots, not freckles. They're much more circular than, than kind of haphazard. And these round spots tend to be black. Some brown trout, the really pretty brown trout, have red spots as well, but they tend to be, certainly you'll have black spots, much more circular. And again, really the thing you're looking for there is you'd want to look at the tail and brown trout won't have any spots on the tail. So you just want to look for those round spots on the body and these golden flanks, and that's a good sign that that's a brown trout. And then the last one that we're likely to catch in a lake in the trout family is called a brook trout. Brook trout are stunning jewels. They're such a pretty trout. And, and their flanks, they tend to be more of a darker color, more of a greenish color, a dark, dark green color. That's the canvas that somebody's painted these jewels on. And brook trout can have red spots and white spots and yellow spots. And they're just the most beautiful of all the trout, I think, when you look at them. So you can see here what this brook trout looks like. Isn't that an absolute jewel? So those really are your four core trout that you're likely to catch on lakes, hopefully giving you a little clue so that if you do catch a fish, you know exactly what it is. Now to catch a fish, you're gonna to have to find out where they are. And as I said, in lakes, fish swim around. So you've got to be able to read a lake. That's what it's called, read a lake. So you've got to understand where fish go and why they go. And it's all about features. So let's talk about some of the features you're likely to find on a lake and things you want to look for when you arrive at a lake for the first time. So when you get to the lake, particularly if it's a new lake, and you've never seen it before, you have no idea where to go fishing. And as I said just now, fish cruise around. So where are they? Where, do I, where should I start fishing? Well, this is where what's called reading the lake comes into play. And reading the lake is basically looking at features and, and things that give you a clue as to where fish will be. So a very important part of understanding lake fishing is to read where your best chance of catching a fish is. And there's a lot of clues, there's a lot of giveaways that can give you a bit more of an edge than just going up to the nearest piece of water and just flinging your fly in and hoping there's a fish there. The most obvious thing you do is look at the water. You look at the water for splashes and swirlies and fish rolling and just life. If you see life and fish in a certain area, well, that's a great area to go because you're actually seeing the fish. Uh, what I would suggest you do when you do that is I would actually take a pair of binoculars with you when you go fly fishing on a lake and you kind of just pick up your binoculars and you have a little scan around and you're looking to find those rising fish. But you're also looking to find some features that are in the lake, which I'm about to tell you about. So rising fish is a really important one. That's a good one or fish movement. Um, outside of rising fish, well, let's look at something like the wind, right? The wind blows, maybe it doesn't blow, but if the wind is blowing and it's blowing this way and there's a hatch of flies, which is where flies swim up from the bottom and, and, and hatch out and then they sit on the surface of the water for a few seconds, the wind is blowing those hatching flies down wind. And so a very good area when you have flies hatching is to go down the bottom end where the wind is blowing onto because it's blowing all that floating food down there. And fish know that and they cruise those edges looking for f food that's floating towards them. Now, if you don't have a hatch, sometimes you get terrestrials, ants, flying ants in particular, grasshoppers, things like that that live on the land that the wind blow onto the lake. That's a terrestrial. And in that situation, if you have terrestrials, a lot of grasshoppers around or flying ants or amazing fish are addicted to those things. Then you go to the other end of the lake because the wind will blow those onto the lake and they struggle around a little bit before they fly away. So depending what's about, you could go to the downwind end or the upwind end, depending on the kind of the bugs that are swimming around or being blown around. Now, and apart from the wind and kind of seeing moving fish and fish food, there's other things that can help you out. Um, to me, I think the best one is what's called a point. And a point is literally just a piece of land that sticks out into the lake. And why those are so effective is because of the cruising fish, the cruising nature of fish. So imagine my hand here is a point and the edge of this desk is the shoreline. And there's a trout swimming five feet from the shoreline. 
And there's another one swimming 10 feet from the shoreline and another one swimming 15 feet and another one that's swimming 20 feet. Well, all of these fish, when they hit the point, are gonna start swimming around the point. Even this five foot one is gonna swim around the point here. And so by standing on the point, you're much further out from the fish and you get all these cruising fish coming around. So points are highly productive areas. So look for a point jutting out into the lake and that will give you a really good chance of catching these cruising fish. And another thing you can look for is look at the, the terrain of the land outside of the lake, not the water itself, but the land. And what you're looking for is the gradient. So a land that slopes with a very gentle slope. Imagine this is the water surface and here's the gentle slope of land. You're going to safely assume that that gentle slope continues underwater, which means a gentle slope is going to have shallow water off it and a steep bank like this is probably gonna have deep water off it. So sometimes weather conditions, whatever, the more advanced stuff is you're gonna to want to fish deep water or you're gonna to want to fish shallow water. And so reading the, the gradient of the land gives you an idea of where those deep bits are and where those shallow bits are. Then apart from that, well, another really good thing to look for is structure. Structure is stuff not just a muddy bottom, structure is stuff. So structure could be trees growing out of the lake, structure could be giant boulders, structure could be floating weed beds, stuff that's just out of the normal of just a piece of muddy bottom with a floating bit of water. And the reason structure is so important is that, first of all, there's cover for fish, they like structure, that kind of gives them bolt holes and areas to escape when they're, if they feel threatened. But secondly, imagine a bit of floating weed, any bugs that are being blown along are gonna hit that floating weed and kind of lock up against that floating weed and go no further. So fish love to cruise structure. So again, use your binoculars, scan around and look for logs and trees growing out and, and floating patches of weed and stuff like that. Those are excellent little resources to look for. Another one, inlet, where the current comes in. A little river coming into the water is fantastic. It's bringing in fresh water, it's bringing food down, it's bringing cooler water down. So in the summer, that's an excellent area to go because the inlet brings in cooler water and fish like to hang around that cooler water. So look for inlets particularly. Those are, those are just different features. And really, there's probably not much more to it than that. Um, there's a lot more, but at this stage, as a novice angler, if, you can, if you've got binoculars and you can understand the gradient of the land and you can look for the points and you can look for these features and, and structure that's out there, you can look for rising fish, you've got a pretty good way of deducing where your best chances of catching a fish are. And gradually, as you become a better fly fisher, you're going to start looking at the subtler things like bubble lines and calm wind lanes and the edges of ripple and calm, things that are more nuanced but will give you a bit more advantage in there. And that really is how to read a lake. So once you've worked out how to read a lake and roughly where you're gonna fish, now you've got to decide how to fish that lake. Whether you fish out of a boat or wade or standing on the shore, you're gonna need some gear to go fishing. We're not gonna talk about gear in any detail because I covered that in an earlier episode. If you wanna understand gear, go back to that episode on basic fly fishing gear. But what I would like to say about lake fishing is you generally speaking want a little bit more of a stouter outfit than you do for river fishing. This is a six weight rod and generally I would go with a six weight. That's a great size of rod for lake fishing. The fish tend to be bigger. They can swim further because the, the, the water body is so large. So you want a little bit bigger rod for that. Plus you want to cast it as far as you possibly can. And the heavier this line is, the further it's going to go. So six weight rod's a great size of rod and I would also probably lengthen the rod beyond the standard nine foot because in lake fishing, again, distance is everything. You want to make long, long casts and you want to make sure that you have a high back cast because there's always going to be grass behind you, unless you're in a boat, but there's always going to be grass behind you. There's going to be banks that rise behind you. So you want a nice long rod that gives you a high back cast and clears that stuff behind you and gets your line out there. So nine foot six, maybe even a 10 foot rod for a six weight line is about the best lake outfit in terms of rod you get. And obviously you have your reel on the end of the rod that's a nice six weight reel. And our standard floating line is probably your go-to line. And with that outfit, I would say you can probably fish successfully maybe 50% of the time. What will take it to more of an 80 or an 85% of the time is you've got to have different densities of line. And again, I'm not going to go into the details of these lines because I cover those in that earlier episode on gear. But the other lines I would suggest you have as, a, as a, a lake angler to have success. The second line I would get 
is a line called an intermediate. An intermediate is an absolutely devastatingly good line. It's a line that sinks pretty slowly and it takes your fishing zone from, say a floating line is from the surface to about three, four feet down. Well, an intermediate takes your fishing zone from about four feet down to about seven or eight feet down. So you can fish your fly in a deeper section of the lake. That's what an intermediate is good for you, about that four to seven foot. Excellent choice of line. Number two in your shopping list in terms of your lines. And then I would add to that the third line would be a fast sinking line. This is a fast sinking line, this dark charcoal gray one. And this one sinks at about six inches per second. So this one is great for fishing from about eight foot of, deep, of depth down to maybe 12 or 14 foot to cover really deep sections. So with these three lines, I can cover a huge chunk of water depth wherever the fish are. Sometimes they cruise near the surface, sometimes they cruise near the bottom, sometimes they cruise mid-water. So I would definitely recommend that you get lines like that that really help and give you the ability to control different depths. And then the other line I would suggest you get, there's a line out there for distance casting. I keep mentioning distance because distance is something you really need in lake fishing. And there are lines designed to get distances. There's presentation lines and there's distance lines. And so when you pick up a line, you can talk to your local fly shop, get a line that goes for distance. We have one called the outbound short. That line is designed specifically to chuck it out a long way. And any line that gives you a bit more distance gives you a bit more advantage over the average line because you cover more water. So that's your rods, reels, and lines. In terms of leaders and tippet material, I don't think there's any reason to go much thinner and much lighter than about six pound or 4X. This would be about as light and as small a leader as I would fish in a lake. Don't need to go down to the five and six Xs that you do as a river angler. So this would be my lightest one. And I would probably also fish quite a lot of 3X in there. So three and 4X are about your right size leader choices. Similar with tippet, 3X and 4X, but here's where I make a big change. When lake fishing, I would highly recommend you go with a material called a fluorocarbon. And a fluorocarbon is a completely different type of material to a nylon, which is what we've been using all this time and talking about. Fluorocarbon has a light refraction index that's very, very similar to water, which means underwater, it's almost invisible to see. I mean, it's literally almost invisible to see, whereas a regular nylon can be seen. That's the biggest advantage fluorocarbons have, is that underwater, they are virtually impossible to see. And many times when you're fishing lakes, you're fishing calm, clear lakes, and fish are cruising around, and you need yourself a little extra edge. So I would definitely get some fluorocarbons to successfully fish out on a lake. And then the last thing we're gonna discuss are flies. Um, as we go into the fishing techniques, I'm gonna tell you how to fish these flies and kind of observations about flies. But I just wanna run through some basics about flies. This is a selection of flies I, I keep with me when I'm lake fishing. What I have here and this panel, these are all flies called coronimids or midge pupas, or in the UK they're called buzzers. What they are are imitations of the larva and the pupa of a midge. The midge lays its eggs, eggs sink to the bottom, hatch out in the mud, and when it's time to come alive, those midges turn into pupas, and those pupas squiggle and wiggle and squiggle and wiggle and move their way up to the surface, and they're highly vulnerable to trout. So having a midge pupa, a coronamid, a buzzer in your fishing selection is essential as a lake angler, as is having a selection of nymphs. Nymphs are a similar stage of a different family of flies. They lay eggs, these eggs hatch into nymphs, the nymphs live on the bottom, and again, when it's time for them to become an adult, those nymphs swim up to the surface and then crawl out of their skin, leave the skin and become an adult. So fish love nymphs. They feed on nymphs when the nymphs are swimming up. So you definitely want a selection of nymphs with you. And when the flies do hatch out and sit on the surface of the water, that's what's called a dry fly. A dry fly floats on the water. You watch a dry fly sitting on the water. You'll see fish feeding on dry flies naturally. And when you see these heads coming up or swirls, that's indicative of the fish that are feeding on these surface flies. So when you see that, that's when you put on a dry fly and fish your dry fly. And all these are your imitative patterns that you fish when fish are feeding. And sometimes they don't feed. And when they don't feed, you've got to annoy them. And that's where what's called a streamer comes in. 
And this is my selection of streamers. I've got some horrendously gaudy things. I've got some big, long things. I've got some purple things. I've got some little things. I've just got an array of flies. And not many of them look like anything real. In fact, if that was flying around, I would run as fast as possible because it looks dangerous and angry. So I wouldn't want any of those flying around. The idea of streamers is that you're going to annoy fish. And again, we're going to go into details about how to fish these shortly. But what I wanted to do is show you the kind of a, an outfit that you need. Make sure you've got some chironomids, midge pupas. Make sure you've got some nymphs. Make sure you've got some dry flies. Make sure you've got some streamers. And you've got a really well-rounded selection of flies for when you go on the water. And you can do my way. You can kind of buy flies or tie flies and gradually over the course of time build up and get a huge array of flies. But when you're starting and you want to get into lake fishing the first few times, what I would suggest you do is you get an assortment of flies, pre-made, pre-packaged, pre-selected for you. This is one that Rio puts out called a streamer assortment. Uh, it's just a selection of flies of all the popular flies that fish like. Uh, there's a still water assortment, which actually is probably better than this because in the still water assortment there's nymphs and there's dry flies and then there's those deadly coronamids as well as streamers. But by getting yourself an assortment, that way you've really got a selection of the most effective flies for lakes. I would probably get three boxes of these, so I've got a couple of spare flies in the case I lose them. And that way you don't really need to start building these big, massive collections as a beginner. As a beginner, you just want to keep it simple. And this is about as simple as you can get. And then the last thing I would suggest you do that's slightly different from the river angler to the lake angler is you get yourself a net that's got a nice long handle. Look at that beautiful long handle. And the reason for that is a lot of the time when you're lake fishing, you're going to be in the boat or you might be standing on a high bank and when you've got a fish on the end and you're trying to net that fish, that fish is a long way from you. So if you've got a nice long handled net, you can kind of really extend down and reach a lot further with a long handle net than you can with a short handled river style, style net. So if you really get into lake fishing, make sure you've got a nice long handle net and that will cover it. And really, that's about all there is to gear. As I said, you want to make sure you've got a six weight outfit. I would certainly have your floater and intermediate and your fast sinking line. Get some fluorocarbons, get a selection of dry flies, selection of nymphs, selection of coronamids, a selection of streamers, and you are good to go fishing. So guess what? Let's get out of the studio. Let's go down to the lake and show you all about how you fly fish in a lake. Okay, so that's a little idea on how to read the water, how to kind of get a rough idea of where to fish in a lake and some of the basic gear and equipment that you need to fish. And now I'm going to just show you a couple of the real basic casts you need. This isn't the casting video. I'm not going to show you how to do it. We have a video on basic casting, and that's one I would recommend watching if you haven't got to that stage. But the basic cast is called an overhead cast. It's a cast that goes up and down over your head like that. And it's a real useful cast. It's the cast you'll use 99% of the time when fishing lakes and still waters. And really all you're going to be doing with it is making these casts where you go back and forth, lengthening the line from your left hand here, getting a little bit longer each time, and then laying the line down on the water. And then you have to make a fish take the fly and how you do that is by retrieving. You pull the fly in and you vary a variety of ways you pull the fly in but you basically pull the line in. And what that means is you're going to have a lot of line down here and very little line out there. And so the next stage once you pull the line close to you is exactly the same thing. You're just going to pick this line up, false cast, gradually lengthen the line, get a bit more line each time and get it out to where you're comfortable and fish that way. And as I said, that'll do you probably 99% of the time as you're getting into lake fishing. But gradually you'll get better at casting and you'll get to want to learn a bit more about casting, more technical casting, more things that give you more distance. And there's no doubt that in lake fishing, the further you cast, the more fish you catch, particularly if you're fishing from the bank and the shore like this. Different when you're in a boat because you're out where the fish are. But from here, you want long, long, long casts. And there's a technique called the double haul. And again, I'm going to show you it not going to talk about how to do it or anything like that, but I just want to show you the effect of double haul. So I pulled off a lot of line here, and the double haul is something you add to your overhead cast. So here's the overhead cast, my normal overhead cast. Now watch my left hand starts to pull and push, pull and push. That left hand move is called double hauling. And what double hauling does is give you high line speed, a lot more loop control, and when you want to let it go, it shoots an awful lot of line with ease. 
So as you get better and better, start looking for the videos and ideas of learning how to do the double hold, because it's an invaluable technique for distance, but I wouldn't try it as a beginner. It, it's, it is a difficult thing to learn. It's like a walking, chewing gum, skipping, hopping, tripping on rocks, all the same time. It's really, it's like so many things happen, but don't try it as a novice, because you will really mess yourself out on your basic technique. But once you're proficient at overhead casting, get into that double hole and it will pay off in spades and in fish. And the only other cast you might need is a cast called a roll cast. And the roll cast is a cast you use when there's obstructions behind you. If there's a tree behind you, you physically can't do an overhead cast. So let me go and find you a little spot somewhere on this lake where there's this back obstruction behind me, stopping me doing the cast. And I'll show you what the roll cast does. And uh, then you'll have all the tools to be a successful lake angler. Here's a perfect spot. I've got a wall of trees behind me. I've got a really good fishy looking spot here. There's bugs on the water. There's a little wind lane out here. This looks like the right spot to be fishing. I can't do my overhead cast. And so in those situations, you've got two options. Don't fish in the good spot or learn another cast. And that other cast is called a roll cast. And simply the roll cast is kind of half of a cast. It doesn't have a back cast because if it has a back cast, you're gonna snag the bush. Roll cast is a cast that looks something like this. You just drag out really slow. Get into a casting position, make a cast and shoot your line out, and then you start fishing it in. So although not everybody's gonna use roll cast and you're not gonna use roll cast every single time you're out fishing, just every now and then you're gonna come across a lake where there's a really good spot and there's fish in that spot and you just can't make your absolute regular overhead cast. And as I said, in those situations, that's where you wanna pick up and learn and know this roll cast. So as you develop your casting skills, get into that roll cast, it'll open up a little bit more water for you. And the best part about that is it opens up water that a lot of other anglers aren't gonna to go to fish. That's a pretty good thing. As I talked about when we we're doing the basic overhead cast and just showing you that, once your fly's out there, that's not the battle. It might be a little technical battle to get it out there. That's what your casting skills are all about. But then the battle becomes, how do you get a fish to take your fly? And that's all in what you do what's called the retrieve, the pulling in of the line. There's numerous ways to do it, and it all depends on what you're fishing. There's flies called streamers, and there's flies called nymphs, there's chironomids, there's dry flies. There's a whole range of fishing patterns that you'd fish to catch something, and that is influenced by how you retrieve it. So, essentially, one of the most important things is you want to keep the line under your finger or your casting hand. If you're left-handed, you're going to keep it under your finger here. If you're right-handed, you're going to keep it under your finger here. You do want to keep your rod tip fairly low. A low rod is much more sensitive. You'll feel grabs that way and you'll have much more effective retrieves with a low rod than a raised rod. And then usually you want to pull from this finger down like this with whatever retrieve it is you're going to do. Don't cast your line out and strip it like this. I see far too many beginners stripping the line like this. And this is stripping it in, all right, but what happens if a fish grabs it now, right? You can't, you've got nothing to grab it and feel it and set the hook. So you do always want to keep the line under the finger and pull from your finger down, and that is called the retrieve. And there's a number of ways of you retrieving. First thing is that you're just going to pull the line in, right? So this little here thing here is the retrieve. You can mix the retrieve up, so I can do short, medium pace ones, I can do tiny little slow things. I can do fast, longer ones. I can do some turbo strips. Those are just ways you change. Always change your retrieve up. And we're gonna talk about that when we get onto some of the fly patterns and show you how to fish those in a moment. I'll show you why I would do it and when I would do it. But basically remember that you're gonna be retrieving the fly. You're gonna be changing up that retrieve. Sometimes you're gonna do a retrieve called a figure of eight which is this kind of thing. And that's just a retrieve. It's a different form of retrieve, but it's still pulling the line in. Sometimes, believe it or not, you're gonna pull the line in and stop. That's called the drop. And what happens is your fly is tracking along like this, and when you stop, it starts to sink. And sometimes fish love that. So sometimes you drop. Sometimes you strip, sometimes you figure of eight, and sometimes you actually bump slack out just to get a natural drift. All those we're gonna look at when we talk about the actual fishing techniques themselves. But the whole point of this is to know that how to hold the line, how to strip it in, and then once you've got it in, get your cast going to get it back out again to catch a fish. So those are your key ways of pulling and retrieving the fly.
One of the easiest ways of fishing a lake, a no-brainer really, is streamer fishing. You incorporate the retrieves we talked about, we put on streamers, and how I like to rig up a good streamer outfit for my lake is I tie on two streamers. Usually I tie on a little leech, very, very popular fly, and this is a black woolly bugger. Again, just a very popular fly. Most lakes around the world, you'll catch fish on both of these. And I tie them apart about three to four feet distance between the two flies. And today, I actually rigged up an intermediate line. We talked about different types of lines to have when you're fishing, and the intermediate's a really important one. And the reason I've rigged up an intermediate line today is one reason, the sun. It's such a bright day out here today, and there's a bit of a wind blowing. I've watched the water, there's no fish, there's no activity at all. And so everything tells me that I'm, the only way I'm gonna catch fish is to go quite deep. The intermediate line will do that with these streamers. So that's the setup. Um, streamer fishing is pretty simple. And one of the reasons it's, uh, it's an easy technique is once you can cast and get your fly out there and you've got your retrieves dialed in, you're just gonna pull in until you feel a grab. And usually when you feel a grab, that's an indication there's obviously a fish has got it in its mouth, pretty obvious. And then when you feel that grab, you're gonna set the hook. Not hard and savage because you can break your leader off, just, just lift, but the moment you feel the grab. Hopefully, we're gonna see that, but let's find out. So, again, as we talked about fishing lakes, it's all about getting the line out there. And I'm gonna cast this line out to start off with, I don't know, 40 feet or so, just get it out. And it's an intermediate line which sinks, so I'm gonna let this line sink. Because it's bright, I'm gonna let this thing sink eight or 10 seconds. I want it to get deep. I'm not gonna do any retrieve, I'm just gonna let it sink. And then once it's at a depth I'm determining is good, I'm just gonna drop my rod tip to the surface of the water and pull in with my left hand. And that's all there is to it. It's just a very basic technique where you're just pulling the fly in, rod low. Note that my rod is pointing straight at the fly line all the time. I want that, I want to have maximum sensitivity when I'm stripping streamers. Sometimes you get a soft grab and when you get a soft grab, you're not gonna feel it if you have a high rod or if the rod's at an angle. So if your rod's up here, I'm not gonna feel anything. If my rod's at an angle to the line, I'm gonna feel less. So I like to have that rod low and close in. So your basic get gist of the of streamers is you're just going to do a medium length retrieve at a medium pace and if you just do that I would say that's a 70 percenter so 70 percent of the time you don't need to do much more than this and you just keep doing it repetitively strip it in until the fly is close lift it up cast it out again now what takes it from 70% to 80% to 90% to 100% is a couple of little subtle tweaks. One is the change of retrieve. So once I retrieve, I don't have that repetitive, same speed, same length to retrieve. I'm gonna retrieve like this, and then I might slow down, and then I love stopping. I'll get a ton of fish on that drop, then retrieve again, and then I might do a couple of quick retrieves, slow it down, maybe another stop here. Slow start, a couple of quick ones, just changing that retrieve up all the time. And that change up along with that drop is gonna get you far more grabs. That's gonna go from 70% to like a 90% chance of getting fish. And then the last little thing I'd like to talk about on that in terms of streamer fishing is that you do want to make sure, a lot of times fish will follow your streamers to the bank and the water's got a bit of murk to it, you can't really see that. So once you start retrieving and you're pausing and you're sinking, I might try a little figure of eight here, pause, you know, just do ch keep changing up those streamer retrieves. But really, I think one of the most important things of all with streamer fishing is that when you get that last 10 feet of line from outside the rod, is you lift the rod rapidly, but leave the flies in the water and lift until you see one fly and then the second fly. And you will be amazed at how many fish grab those flies when you're lifting up to look at them. And it's because fish will follow your flies plenty of times and you don't know it, right? They're underwater, so you can't see that happening, but they're following your flies. But the lift that you give makes those flies rise to the surface and the fish think those flies escape it, getting away. So they surge forward and grab them. So a great re retrieve of the streamers, I'd say do the mix and match retrieve, some pause, change of speed, and then that last 10 feet just lift, 
keep pulling, lifting the rod. There's my fly, one fly, there's the other fly. Nothing took it, so I'm gonna cast out again. I think you'll be far more effective with that variety of retrieves and that also that lifting carefully to watch your flies than just doing the 70 percenter all the time. And all the time you're searching for fish, so I'm gonna let this one sink maybe 12 seconds before I start retrieving. It's gonna be quite a bit deeper as a result, so I'm covering a different depth now by having that longer pause. Same retrieve, same change up. And so really streamer fishing is about that. You just mix up your retrieves, you mix up how long you let it pause, you make sure you retrieve the fly all the way to the bank and then you lift your rod until you can see the flies. And you keep doing that and with those techniques and skills, you're probably, as I said, at about a 90%, 95% chance of catching a fish with streamers. And streamers aren't the only way of retrieving a fly. There's a fly type we talked about earlier, nymphs, chironomids, buzzers, flies like that. So there's other ways of fishing retrieves, working the fly with other techniques. We're gonna take a little look at that in a moment. But first, let me just give me five minutes to try and catch a fish. While a streamer fishing is probably the simplest way of fishing because you just chuck it out, you pull it in, you get a grab, you don't get a grab. The dry fly is probably the most fun, certainly in my book. And you fish dry flies, dry flies are flies that float on the water, and you would fish a dry fly because fish are rising. There's what's called a hatch out. Either flies are coming off the land, being blown off terrestrials like beetles, ants, grasshoppers. They can get blown onto the water and fish will eat those. Or underwater, believe it or not, there's these things called nymphs, and the nymphs live on the bottom and they swim to the surface when it's time to hatch and they crawl out of a skin and then they sit on the surface and that's an adult. And that adult sits on the surface for a few seconds, half seconds, until its wings are dry and then it flies off. And the fish love eating those adults when on the surface. They're very vulnerable during those few seconds. And so you'll look around and you'll find fish rising. When you see fish rising, that's a great clue to fish dry flies. And I've come up to this end of the lake for a couple of reasons. One, it's shallower here, so fish cruising around on the bottom have no distance to go to take the flies on the surface. In deep water, if they're down deep, they've got a long way to come. Two, the wind is coming from here, blowing onto the lake, so terrestrials will blow onto the lake. Flies that are hatching in the shallow water will blow out into the lake, and so the fish are going to be rising here. And three, this is calm. And one of the best things, one of the best skills a dry fly angler has is the powers of observation. When you see a fish rise, you cast to it. And that's so important because fish in lakes cruise around constantly. When you see a fish rise, one second later, it could be five feet to the right or to the left or anywhere. And so when a fish rises, you cast as quickly as you can to that rising fish and you try and land your fly on the windward side so the wind blows it over where that fish rose. So that is the theory of dry fly fishing. I always fish a couple of flies. I've got a large fly here that's called a sita. It's an orange fly. Big dry fly, it's about a size 12, maybe a size 10. And it's a visible fly, so if I make a long cast, I can see it way out there. And then on the end, about four feet behind it, I've got my smaller fly that represents the natural. And what I see on the water here floating around are these dark kind of charcoal colored flies again. You don't really need to know the names of them. There's a dark charcoal color fly on the water. I'm putting a kind of a dark gray fly on the, on the fly. So this is the fly likely to get a fish. This, they could eat this, but this is my visual fly. The one I can see at range, my pointer. And then I need to make the flies float. And so one of the things you do is you have a little bit of floatant on you and you just coat the flies in some kind of fly floatant. There's plenty of them in the fly shops. You coat that fly in floatant, coat this fly in floatant. And um, the floating will mean the fly will last a bit longer, will stay up, on the, stay up on the water a bit longer than if you don't, otherwise it absorbs water and starts to get waterlogged and sinks. So that's my rig. I've got about a 12 foot leader on, quite a long leader here because I want my fly line to land far away from the fish, right? The fly line's visible, the fly line lands with fairly big of a splash, and this is flat calm. So I've got a much longer leader than I would normally fish. And that's really all there is to it. So, the fishing technique is pretty easy. You need a bit of patience, right? You're going to cast your dry flies out. And right now I'm just going to plonk them down just about here. And you're not going to do any retrieve. You're just going to leave the flies to sit on the water. And 
when you've chosen the right situation to fish a dry fly, there's going to be fish rising here and fish rising there, and you cast your fly amongst those fish, and you don't have to wait long before one will come up and grab your fly. Right now, nothing's physically rising, so I'm just doing this to demonstrate really what you do or what you don't do. There's not much you do. You just cast out and you have a bit of patience and you wait. But you do want to strip out as much line as you think you're capable of casting. Because the essence of successful dry fly fishing in lakes is to understand how quickly a fish moves from where it's grabbed the fly and you go, oh, look, there's a rising fish, to where it's moved 20 feet away. So I am now prepared. If a fish rises eight feet in front of me, I can cast. If it rises 40 feet in front of me, I've got enough line there to cast and quickly cover it. So I'm just gonna wait. It's a floating line, it sits on the water. And then I'm gonna wait for a fish to rise. And when a fish rises, as I said, I'm gonna cast, in this case, to the left side, so the wind blows it over that rising fish. If nothing's rising, one really good location to put a dry fly is on the edge of ripple and calm. So there's a little bit of ripple and calm out here. I'm just gonna cast my fly onto the edge of that ripple and calm. That's a great area to leave it. Fish cruise the edge of that. Flies get stuck in that edge of that calm and ripple. So fish cruises that edge. So you just kind of, if you don't have any rising fish, you just put your fly out there and wait and wait for a couple of things. One, you might get a rise, so you're ready. And when you do get a rise, oh my gosh, the hardest thing on the dry fly is that slow hook set. The old Victorian books, of dry fly fishing talked about saying, God save the queen. So you see the fish rise, God save the queen, and then just lift into it. So it doesn't matter what you say, but basically just don't react with a sudden snatch because you'll pull it out of the fish's mouth every time. Now, what's interesting here, because the wind is blowing away from me, my dry fly is sitting in the same spot where it landed because my line is tight. A natural that had landed there would have drifted a little bit further. So one of the things to do with dry fly fishing when there's nothing rising, or even when they are rising, is every now and then bump a little bit of slack. And that bump allows your dry fly to drift a bit further, more like the natural would. And then really it's up to how much patience you have. It is a patient game. It's my favorite game. I love the visualness of dry fly. I love the eats. It's such a turn on to see a big nose just come out of the water and roll on your fly and you go, one, two, three. Oh, yes. It's all that visual aspect. So it's quite a skill. It's a lot of patience game. Right now, there's nothing rising. Of course, it's just typical because we've got the camera on. We're all rising just now. But that is the essence of dry fly fishing. And then when you've got to a point where you're bored enough or your fly has gone out far enough, then just you can work the fly and you can pull it in, in little twitches. Sometimes the fish will take your fly being retrieved underwater. Oh, there's a rise. So a fish just rose to my left. So I'm gonna pick up, cast quickly, lay it as close to that fly fish as I can. Oh, come on. So I know my fly is within feet of a happy feeding fish. And that's the importance of being ready for any rising fish. You cover it when you see it rise. Oh, he's risen again. He's a little further out from me now. Didn't quite have enough line pulled off. But I'm close. I'm within a foot and a half of it. Come on. He did. Oh, my gosh. He's now the three feet foot. He's, he's playing. He's moving away from me. Little sod. But I'm just going to wait there. He probably will come back. Again, fish have this path, the cruising path. So really, that's the essence of your dry fly fishing. All right, fish a couple of dries. If you're a good enough caster, do fish too. I think you get a better chance with two true dries. Make sure you coat them in floatant. Make sure you look for naturals like these floating around. There's a whole pile of naturals just being blowing off. That's what the fish are looking for. I've tried to imitate one of those naturals. Cast to rising fish. Make sure you feed a little bit of slack so it drifts naturally. And for goodness sake, when a fish eats that fly, don't snatch, which you will if you're a beginner, because everyone does. I did, everyone does. Remember, it's just a slow lift. And that, in a nutshell, is dry fly fishing on a lake. So I'm gonna shut up and just concentrate on trying to catch a fish on the dry fly because one has just risen right there. And nymph fishing is another style of fishing lakes. Pretty effective. A couple of ways to do it. There's the retrieving way where you work your flies and make them move by retrieving them in various ways. Kind of like we do with the streamers. Generally not as fast as that. 
Uh, and then there's also a fishing and indicator where you throw it out and you just let that drift in the wind like, kind of like a dry fly until they bob under. I'm going to show you both ways. What I've set up here is I've set up two nymphs. Now, what's interesting about lake fishing is there's a, there's a, a family of flies, diptera, flat wing families, midges to be precise, that lay their eggs on the water. The eggs sink into the mud, the mud hatch, the eggs hatch into a pupa or a larva, and the larva hatch into a pupa. And then those pupa, when it's time to become a, an adult, swim to the surface, and drop down a bit, swim to the surface, and drop down a bit, swim to the surface, and emerge as the adult. That's a midge pupa, commonly called a coronamid. So if you're fish, getting into lake fishing, you're going to hear this term coronamid. A coronamid represents the pupa of a midge. Essentially, it's a nymph. A nymph is the pupa of a different type of fly. It could be a caddis, it could be a stonefly, it could be a mayfly, but a midge pupa or a coronamid is a pupa of a different fly. What's semantics? What does that mean? Well, not much in terms of where you fish it. Just some days people are going to say, oh, I was catching them on coronamids, you know, and coronamids are these pupa of the midges. The techniques I'm going to show you apply to whether nymphs or coronamids. You can have one of each on your line if you want. You can have two coronamids. You can have two midges. You can have two nymphs. I've set up two nymphs here just because I like nymphing. Um, we've seen a few dry flies come off. That means there's nymphs have been swimming around and emerging. Hasn't been so many midges coming off, which means there's less pupa action. So that's why I've set up nymphs, but I'll show you both. I've got about a three foot gap between them. Uh, and I've got a, a, a heavy fly on the point because what I want to do is I want the fly, the heavy fly to pull the lighter fly down. I'm on a floating line. And even though today is bright, which it is, and there's a bit of a breeze, I got it with this long leader and this heavy nymph, my fly will sink even on a floating line down to about six or seven feet. If I want to get deeper than that, the techniques I'm about to show you, you can easily do on an intermediate line and you can easily do them on a sinking line. Don't think these are just for floating lines. And really, all you're trying to do is you are trying to imitate the real bug, whatever the bug is under the fish are feeding on. I've come to a corner here in the lake and I like corners when I'm fishing nymphs. I like corners where the wind blows into them. And I like corners where there's a bit of depth and there's a bit of ripple. I think these are great assets. And one of the reasons is that trout will be cruising around looking for food and any natural food is gonna drift and end up in this far bank here, whether it's on the surface or just subsurface. So trout do like to patrol those edges right where the wind blows onto the shore. And I'm close enough to let my nymphs swing into that. And that's the idea. So that's why I've chosen this location. The technique that I'm going to show you, the easy technique is um, requires nothing other than a couple of nymphs or a couple of coronamids on the leader. You cast your fly out and because it's a floating line it's not going to get very deep instantly so I'm going to wait. And I've cast 90 degrees across the wind and what I want to happen is I want the wind to blow the line around towards this corner. That's just drifting the nymphs in beautifully. It's also allowing the nymphs to sink. And because it's bright, I want these nymphs to sink quite deeply. I don't think, I don't see any fish rising. I don't think the fish will be near the surface for that reason, because I haven't seen rises and it's also bright. And once I let it sink 10, 15 seconds as I have now, I'm gonna start my retrieve. And my retrieve has always comes from this finger. The commonest, most effective retrieve is called the figure of eight, where you pinch the line in your thumb and index finger. You basically twist your hand flat and you close your three fingers on it. Let go with your thumb and index finger rotate your thumb and index finger back and grab, and twist, and grab, and twist. And that's called a figure of eight, or a finger twist retrieve. And that's usually your most effective retrieve when fishing coronamids or nymphs. You just figure of eight, drop each one, down like that. The rod stays low. We're not gonna see anything because the nymphs are six, seven feet down. You're gonna feel a grab, hopefully. So that's another reason why you wanna keep that rod tip low. I wanna make sure I have a maximum contact to the flies and I'm going to retrieve and kind of like we did with the streamers I'm going to change it up I might do a few fast figure of eights and I might just stop and let it drop I could just do a couple of little tweaks like this as well point is keep changing up your retrieve and then just gradually work your fly in towards you and the reason I like this technique is that I'm doing something all the time this one I'm retrieving I'm working the fly I'm 
My skill is imparting the movement into the fly, which is attracting the fish. So if I get a, get a grab doing this, I feel like I've earned it. That's why I like fishing nymphs and coronamids with this retrieval method. And then the same as we did with the streamers, once you've got that last five or six feet, don't cast it out, just lift slowly. Lift until you can see your flies and that nothing's following them. And then make your cast out again. And this current time, I'm gonna make a cast a few feet to the right. And just do the same process. Again, I want the fly to be six or seven feet down because it's really bright. There's a nice deep spot in here. So I'm gonna wait. And that's again the patience game, right? There's a lot of patience game, particularly in lake fishing. River fishing, less patience is needed because the fish are a bit more predictable here. They're not predictable, so you've got to wait for fish to come to you rather than you go to the fish. Okay, so now that's down a little bit deeper. I'm just gonna work it in. Alternate that retrieve. And again, because you're gonna feel a grab, that was either a grab or a bit of weed, felt something there. Because you're gonna feel, the moment you feel any resistance, you do what I just did. You just lift and set the hook with a quite a sharp one. This isn't like the dry fly where you lift steadily with a God save the queen kind of count. This one, the moment you feel something, it's either a bit of weed on the line or it's actually got, a fish has got the fly in its mouth. So the moment you feel something, set the hook. Don't set it so hard that the fly comes pulling out of the, into the water and into the air behind you. If you set it like I just did then, and if it happened to be a fish and I missed it, my fly is still there where that fish was. So I'm gonna let this sink less this time. Just retrieve. I know my fly is now probably only two feet down because I didn't let it sink long. I'm retrieving a little bit quicker. You might like a quicker retrieve. Always give the pause. Just change it up. And that's how you do it. Basically you alternate whilst you're in a spot like this. I know this is a great spot to fish. I'm convinced fish will be in here. So in a day of fishing, if I was fishing this technique here, I would be alternating how long I let the fly sink. I'll be alternating my retrieve. I'll be doing some casts at this angle and some casts at this angle. I'll probably change my fly up a couple of times from browns to blacks to olives, just change the colors. But that's the essence of fishing nymphs on the retrieve like that. And as always, when you get close, lift, Nothing following, cast again. As I said, that's my favorite way. I like that because I'm doing something. But the other way of fishing nymphs is you put on this buoyant visible thing called an indicator. I'm gonna put it on in a second. And you chuck it out and you just let that indicator drift and you just wait. There's virtually no retrieve. You just wait until it bobs under. And that is the last technique I'm gonna show you on this basic guide to lake fishing. <laughs> The other way of fishing the nymph stroke coronamid is with an indicator. Here's an indicator, great big float, big strike indicator, bobber, you can call it whatever you like, but it's a brightly visible, highly buoyant thing that chuck out in the water and it floats around, bobs, and when it goes underwater, it's because a fish has eaten your fly and you set the hook. What I've set up here is, what's important about fishing the indicator is a couple of things. First of all, the depth. I have set the distance from my indicator to my point fly, the heavy fly on the front end, here to be about six feet. That's because I've got a deep bay here. Um, just looking at the gradient of the water here, the way it goes in and the bank, it looks like the water's gonna be six, seven, eight feet deep there. So I want my nymph to be near the bottom. And then about three feet from that, mid water in other words, I have a second fly tied on. So I'm gonna cover two different depths and my indicator is the thing I watch. And you won't feel any grabs with this one, very rarely, but you'll see your indicator bob. And what's important about fishing under an indicator is that the fly line hangs directly underneath it. You don't want it sinking slowly. And so as a result of that, there's a couple of options. The one I prefer is to use a fly with a heavy bead on the front end at the very end. That bead is heavy, it sinks, it pulls a nymph down, it makes this, this other nymph sink quickly so I can get down deep really quickly. If you don't have heavy flies or heavy nymphs or heavy coronamids, then a lot of anglers take a little bit of split shot and crimp split shot on the leader close to that fly and that gets it down. It doesn't matter which, but what's important, especially when you've got six feet between your indicator and your fly, is that you use a weighted something, fly or piece of weight, to get those flies down. And this is kind of like the dry fly fishing and it's visual and it's the patience game. There's not a lot of retrieve, if any. You're gonna cast your gear out, your rig out. 
You're going to let it sink. And as I watch it, I can see that the leader is floating behind the indicator and gradually it's sinking. Part of the leader is sinking, running back. And that means that nymph, in this case, the coronamid, is sinking down nicely and deeply. And now the entire leader has disappeared. I don't see the leader behind the indicator. So I know it's underwater and almost vertical. And what I want is obviously a drift. I want that thing to be natural. And so just like we talked about in the dry fly, if I see the line is tight between me and the visual, in this case, the indicator, I'm just gonna pull off a little bit of slack, just bump a little bit of slack, and that allows it to drift out a little bit. This one, as I said, you don't see anything except the indicator bob down. You don't see a swirl, you don't feel a grab, so your eyes are all the time on the indicator. And the moment it bobs under, or sometimes it just twitches sideways. Sometimes a fish doesn't go down with it, it just pulls the fly and you see your indicator move to the side. So when you see your indicator do something completely different, assume it's a fish and set the hook. And that is an instantaneous strike, not like the God Save the Queen of the Dry Fly. If that bobbed, I would go, do a quick set like that. And that's it, this is the patience thing, right? So some people aren't into this style of fishing because it, is, it can be mundane. It's, you cast this out and you might wait an hour doing nothing, except maybe cast it here and cast it there. But one thing's for certain, if you know what the depth is and you've set your depth right and you've set your indicator right and those weighted nymphs or coronabids on there, you wait long enough, that indicator will bob down and then you'll have a fish on the end. So now it's the patience game. And really, those are just the quickest simplest ways to fish a lake, right? A little summary of the ways I would fish a lake. I haven't gone into any detail with these. I just want to give you outlines. This is a basic video for fly fishing. And I just wanted to, just the basics of it. We can go into more detail. You can find out more detail about these from your local fly shop online, other videos and stuff like that. But really, when you get to the lake, you've got to read the water, get an idea where the fish are. You obviously got to have the right amount of gear. It's worth working on your retrieve. So you've got an understanding of all the subtleties of the retrieve. And then just pay attention. If fish rise, fish a dry fly. If they're not rising, you can fish a nymph and an indicator. You can work your nymph. You can fish a sinking line and fish streamers. And as you play around throughout the day, you're going to find techniques that catch fish for you, techniques that ring your bell because you enjoy them, and techniques that are pretty mundane and you don't enjoy them. And just get out in the water, keep fishing, and you'll catch plenty of fish. The more you fish, the more you'll catch, and the better you'll get, and the more fun you'll have. And that's what this is all about. That's a nice, that'll drift out to them. See, there you go. Beautiful. That's the perfect place to put a dry fly. So when we've got a fish on the end of the line, a couple of things about playing the fish. One is to keep the rod fairly high. That gives you shock absorption. So when the fish pulls, the rod bounces and takes a strain, not your leader. Always try and pull the fish the direction away from where it's trying to go. If it's going left, I'm going to try and pull it right. And most important of all is when you pull in, don't pull the line close, so close to you can't reach with a net. One of the long handled nets, you can reach out Make yourself low presence. Make sure your net is underwater fully. And then when the fish is ready, just lift the rod and pull it back over your head until the fish is in the net. And I've done that because I've kept at least 10, 9, 10 feet of line outside the rod. A lot of people pull that line in too close and they can't reach it. So always keep about a rod length of line outside your rod when you're netting a fish. Keep low, keep the net underwater. And that's how you net a fish. And one of the things to always understand about fish, obviously, is please respect these things. They're beautiful creatures, whether they're wild fish or hatchery fish or stockfish, they're beautiful creatures. Handle them with respect, keep them wet, that's their natural environment, so I'll keep them in the water. I don't want to lift them out if I'm going to return them. Different if you're going to keep one. I like to unhook the fish in the net, like that, take, unhook the flood fish. And then if I'm going to pose for photos, my friend, he's got a camera there, I'm going to wait with the fish in the water like this until he's ready. When he's ready with a camera, the fish is not under any duress or stress like this. Then I'm simply going to lift the fish out of the, out of the net, gently holding it. I keep the net under the fish so that if I drop it, it hopefully doesn't go away. I can still get that shot. It's a beautiful rainbow trout. And keep it low. One of the important things about with fish is Keep them wet, so at all stages, you don't want to lift the fish out and let it just dry out. They don't like that. So you lift it out, and as long as water's dripping off it, it hasn't been out of the water too long. This guy's still feisty, he wants to get back. See, I'd pose, I'd get my photo like this. Nets under the fish in case I drop it. That's long enough out of the water. Maybe give him another drink. 
get more photos or whatever. And then when you do put them back, just keep the fish, keep the head under the water, tilt your hand up and just let it slide out and swim away rather than fling it in like a piece of rag doll or something like that. I say, please treat them with respect. They're beautiful creatures. You spend all this time trying to catch them. So respect them. And that, that's probably the best way of returning a fish with enough common sense and enough thoughtfulness to justify going fly fishing. So there you have it, a simple guide to fly fishing in a lake. In this episode, I covered how to find fish in a lake, the kind of gear you need to fly fish in a lake, and above all, the techniques and tactics that can give you confidence to go out and fly fish a lake and catch fish. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope it gives you that confidence that you go down to your local water and go out fly fishing in the lake and start catching fish on the lake. And whether you fish a river or a lake, please remember, respect the environment. Leave no trace of you being there on the water. And above all, look after those beautiful things you're catching. Those fish are absolute treasure and precious gems. So please look after them. Many thanks for watching. I hope to see you out there on the water one day. Mm -hmm.